mobilization and uh, uh, all the news and, and all the deaths that, uh, that we witness, uh, clearly it is a, a major threat, uh, or I would say a threat with, uh, with unknown potential in terms of its eventual impact. At the same time, uh, I call this as possibly being a once in a century evidence fiasco because uh, we are dealing with such uh, an unknown and uncharacterized evolving threat with very limited data. Many of our actions are just uh, based on gut feelings, uh, trying to do the most, trying to do our best, but without knowing whether some of them will lead to more harm than good. Unless we do get reliable information, uh, we may just continue doing whatever we do with the best intentions, but doing it just blindly, uh, which is uh, so unreliable for getting the big picture, as I described before. And so if, if it's possible that the, the death rate in Italy would need to be corrected by a factor of 100, what explains, I mean, we, we hear that there and in so many other places that the medical system is already being overwhelmed and there are these shortages. So what would account for that if indeed the death rate is likely lower than they say it is? I am collaborating with uh, scientists who are leading the Italian response, and I'm trying to get their insights. And uh, this has been a, a very interesting uh, puzzle uh, that uh, we have been brainstorming on. Uh, there are multiple explanations uh, so far that can be proposed on why uh, Italy uh, really became such a disaster. And these include the following. Uh, first of all, it's uh, demographics. Uh, Italy has the most elderly population in Europe and uh, one of the most uh, elderly populations in the world. It is uh, far uh, more older people on average compared to a country like the US or, or most of uh, the other countries. And we know very well that uh, SARS-CoV-2 has a markedly uh, steep increase in uh, mortality in people who are very old. The average age of uh, people who die in Italy is 81 years old. And also, most of these people have lots of other underlying diseases. Uh, Italy is a country that has a very strong history of smoking. It has very high rates, therefore, of chronic ob obstructive pulmonary disease. It has very high rates of uh, coronary heart disease. Uh, and uh, these are very strong risk factors for having a bad outcome in this infection. If you want to, to transplant these data to another population, you need to uh, account for that differential case mix uh, and try to adjust accordingly what your expectation would be in a different country. Another observation that uh, has uh, emerged is that many of these people probably would have had very limited life expectancy in the absence of uh, that infection. And uh, it still remains uh, to be decided how many of these infections are deaths with SARS-CoV-2 uh, versus deaths by SARS-CoV-2, uh, meaning uh, that the virus has the key influence on the outcome rather than just giving a final kick uh, or participating among many other factors in shaping the outcome, but these people having multiple other reasons that they would have uh, a very poor uh, endpoint uh, and, and eventually die, uh, many of them. There's uh, also other things that probably got wrong in Italy. Uh, Italy has uh, a relatively uh, low number of ICU beds per population. It has about a third of ICU beds per population compared to the US. And their system is running at uh, full capacity practically every winter at uh, 95 to 98%. So if you get just a little bit extra, you're very close to the point of collapse. And we know that uh, in winter, there is, a, there is a, a 25 to 30 percent increase in the number of deaths compared to summer months. A major part of that contribution is uh, deaths due to respiratory pathogens. And typically, every year, this is due to influenza. Now, this year, it could be influenza plus SARS-CoV-2. But you realize that a system that is so close to saturation, to having its maximal capacity, if you add just a little bit more, it can very easily collapse. Italians were the first to be hit in Europe, and that was an exotic pathogen. 
Everybody thought that uh, they had to do their best. So uh, they said we need to admit these people to the hospital even if they had modest or not so severe symptoms. This resulted in a very bad decision making and I think that this is something that every other setting that is hit by an epidemic wave needs to avoid. By admitting these mild or moderate cases very quickly they became saturated and when they started getting the severe cases uh, they just had no room for them. So. Uh, also, the hospital became heavily colonized with that new virus. Uh, this is a virus that can stay on surfaces. Uh, many of their medical personnel got infected in that heavily infested environment. About 3,000 uh, people in the medical personnel in Italy got infected, and they had to leave the, the battle uh, to be in quarantine, uh, making things even worse. So there's, there's a lot of factors that uh, created like the perfect storm. Uh, if you add to that uh, some probably lack of strict measures in the early phases, uh, for example, lack of strict uh, personal hygiene might have been an issue, uh, large congregations in, uh, in one setting in Bergamo, which is the city that has been most uh, uh, hit uh, by uh, this pandemic uh, to date, there was a match of uh, Champion League that uh, attracted wide attention and uh, about a third of the population of Bergamo not only saw the match but they also celebrated until very late hours after midnight uh, embracing and, uh, and dancing and, and probably kissing each other, who knows. Uh, and you had tens of thousands of people out in the street in very, very close contact. There's, there's lots of things, I think, that explain uh, much of what we see in Italy. We also need to consider that it is an outlier. We have 200 countries and they have the worst uh, uh, outcomes today. And even within Italy, it's not the entire country. It's specific cities and specific hospitals, actually a small minority of hospitals that faced uh, these extreme odds and uh, uh, so pretty much a uh, situation of crashing because there will be a resurgence of a new epidemic wave. In situations where you have uh, probably a very large number of uh, uh, cases in the community, many of them asymptomatic or, or undetected, we just don't know what is the best uh, strategy. I believe that uh, the measures that are taken uh, should be taken because uh, we need to do something. At the same time, though, we need to get an estimate of where we stand, how many people are infected, and how does that change? Because uh, we need to make decisions within a week, within two weeks, uh, three weeks maximum that are informed by reliable data. If we shut everyone in their house, uh, it is a solution. You know, if, if we manage to even isolate everyone, not even uh, being in touch with any other person, in theory, we are containing uh, the spread of the virus. So as you realize, this is very difficult to do. It has lots of consequences. And for a society like ours, it means that uh, very soon you will start seeing a major impact on the economy. Uh, we already see that. If the economy is ruined, you have unemployment, you have poverty, you have bankruptcies. You have uh, uh, lots of diseases that are associated with this sort of social and economic disruption. We have strong evidence that that can lead to an increase in depression, in anxiety, in suicides, uh, in heart attacks, uh, in common things, in, in things that cumulatively could have a much higher impact on deaths compared to what uh, SARS-CoV-2 can achieve on, on its own. So there are some models that suggest that if you go down that path of uh, basically lockdown, you may need to wait for 18 months. And I'm, I'm extremely worried about that scenario. I'm, I'm not sure that our world, our civilization uh, could survive that. I think that there is not just millions of lives at stake, which is the pessimistic scenarios about uh, SARS-CoV-2. It is billions of lives uh, who might be at stake if we have to protect.